in this discussion, we're going to talk about and give you a little bit of detail about homology. Homology is really central to all of what we are going to be doing through the rest of the semester. It's the foundation. It's the way that we establish how we compare different features in one organism to another organism. And so if we can't make a direct comparison between two features, whether it's a forelimb or a piece of DNA that we're looking at, then we're stuck. We can't really look at how organisms are connected to one another and why they're similar or why they're different. We have to somehow be able to establish those homologies. So first, I just want to review topics we talked about in our last discussion. You should be very familiar with these. When we are classifying organisms, we want to make sure we do it by clades. And a clade is a group of descendants that come from a common ancestor without leaving any of the descendants out. That is a valid clade. And so the only clades that are valid are monophyletic. The one in yellow here, notice they've highlighted all these. We put all these in one group. We've got a common ancestor. We haven't left out any of the descendants. Both paraphyletic and polyphyletic groupings are not valid. The blue one, if we put lemurs, lorises, and tarsiers into one group, that would be a paraphyletic group because the tarsiers are more closely related to this group of primates. And we would have left out that entire group from our classification. And then, of course, polyphyly, lorises, and tarsiers put into a single group is invalid because we left out both the lemurs and the yellow group here, which are all descendants from the common ancestor of the lorises and the tarsiers. And again, remember, you can't just look what's right next to each other on the diagram, right? Because often things that are right next to each other are only very distantly related to one another. You have to look at how they are connected via these common ancestral nodes. Okay, so a bit of a review. All right. So, actually, I've got these a little bit out of order. Let's do that one first. Let's define homology very quickly. Very simply, but it's deceptively simple. Um, once we get into it, there are actually some details that can make it a little bit more complex, but we'll start with the simple. Homology is similarity of features that are due to inheritance from a common ancestor. And let's give you a morphological example. Here we have diagrams of four different uh, tetrapod vertebrates. These are all mammals, but we could even choose a frog or a lizard or, or a bird or something like that. It would still work fine. So notice, despite there being differences in shape and even loss of some bones, right? So the whale is missing a couple of the phalanges. But other than that, we can make very clear connections between the components of the forelimb. The forelimb itself, obviously, is homologous, but even the components of it, we can say, oh, look, the human, the cat, the whale, the bat, they all have a humerus because their ancestor had a humerus, and it was passed down to them from that ancestor. And there are going to be some similarities. There's going to be an attachment. There's going to be a, a distal articulation. But despite some of the differences, we have some high levels of similarity. I don't know if you re realize this externally, it doesn't really look a lot like it for some of these organisms, but a whale has a humerus, a radius, an ulna, it has carpals and even metacarpals and even has phalanges. So whales have fingers. Of course, they serve a very different purpose. They're served to reinforce and stabilize their fins and very different from human phalanges. And numbers and counts are different. However, they are still similar enough that we can make these connections to ancestrals. And so if I was to ask you, did the ancestor of all mammals have a forelimb? And you look across all the mammals, all extant living mammals have a forelimb. That's a very, very easy uh, supposition to make is that, yes, definitely the mammal had a for the ancestral mammal must have had a forelimb because all mammals today have forelimbs. And we could even talk a little bit about what that forelimb looked like. It was probably uh, fairly um, simple, not very specialized. And we can know that because a majority of mammals have uh, some similar features in common. And so we can talk about how, well, that ancestor almost certainly all had a humerus. It had a radius. It had an ulna and carpals. All these features that we see across the mammals must have been there in that common ancestor. And so that is a fairly simple supposition to make because of the uh, retention of that forelimb in all living mammals. And so we call a feature that is 
common to all descendants of, a, of an ancestor, a synapomorphy. So technically, a synapomorphy is a derived ancestral trait that is shared between two or more species. So you should write that down and make a note of it. And we're going to be a little technical here. A derived ancestral trait that is shared between two or more species. That is a synapomorphy. So here I have an example mapped onto a phylogeny. And in this phylogeny, the little circles represent some character state. And the ancestors are marked here also. Now, in reality, we may not know what the ancestral states are because we don't have a time machine in, in lieu of fossils or really, really good fossil evidence. We don't know what the ancestral state is. But here they've marked it just to be clear. So I have a synapomorphy. It was derived somewhere between that ancestor and that ancestor. And often this is marked. In fact, let's put it in here just so you can see it. So I'm going to insert a shape. And this is often the way an evolutionary change is marked, by a bar. Let's just make it black so it's easy for you to see. A bar across one of the branches represents an evolutionary change. So somewhere between that ancestor, which has the gray character state, and this ancestor, which has the black character state, we put a bar representing a change. Okay, So that's an evolutionary event, a mutation. Okay. And so this ancestor inherits it, it passes it down to descendants, and if all the descendants still have it, that becomes a synapomorphy for that clade, for that monophyletic group. And in fact, monophyletic groups are often named and always defined by these synapomorphies. Right? So mammals are named after mammary glands. All mammals still have mammary glands. That's a great synapomorphy. Right? Birds are defined by a couple of synapomorphies. A beak is a really good synapomorphy for birds. Now, I'm going to be a little bit pedantic here just to be very, very clear. Let me pose a question to you and let you think about it for a couple of seconds. Is feathers a synapomorphy for the birds? So the first thing you should be thinking of, do all birds have feathers? And the answer is yes. Now, the second thing that we need to think about when we're posing this question is, are there other organisms that have that characteristics? So for instance, if I said uh, a bony skeleton is a synapomorphy for mammals, the first thing you think of, well, do all mammals have bony skeletons? And the answer is yes. But it's not a synapomorphy for mammals because it actually is derived from a much more ancient ancestor than the ancestor of all mammals. So of course, of course, a bony skeleton is a synapomorphy for a very ancient group going all the way back to ancient fish. And of course, mammals and, and amphibians and reptiles are, are part of that group now of having bony skeletons. So it is a synapomorphy, but not for the group mammalia. So now let's go back to our original question. Is feathers a synapomorphy for the group that we call birds? Aves is the is the the scientific term for that group. And if you only looked at living species, then you would probably say, yes, yeah, the only birds have feathers. All of the birds have them. So yeah, that's a good synapomorphy for birds. However, once we include the fossil record, particularly fairly recent finds of, of very well-preserved organisms, we realize that feathers is not a synapomorphy for birds. Feathers were derived much earlier than in the group that we call birds. Many of the theropod, in fact, most scientists now think that all of the theropod dinosaurs at one stage of their life or another had feathers. And they looked a little different than some of the modern bird feathers, but they were very distinctly feathers. And so feathers becomes a synapomorphy for that larger group that includes the birds, but not the birds themselves. So just be aware of that. When we say the term synapomorphy, we need to define a character. We need to define a group. And then if all the organisms in that group have that characteristic and no other organisms outside of the group have it, then it becomes a synapomorphy. So synapomorphy, of course, is a type of homology. It's a simple homology that evolved one time in the ancestor. And all of the descendants of that ancestor still have that characteristic. So we can establish homology in a number of ways. Number one, we can look at the morphological position of a feature. So if I'm talking about forelimbs, 
there's some very distinctive ways that those forelimbs are attached to the pectoral girdle, and that pectoral girdle is attached to the backbone, and we can see that fairly clearly. So there's some pretty similar positional data that allows us to have a good idea that those forelimbs are homologous. We can also, of course, look at overall similarity. If things are very, very, very similar, especially if it's a complex trait that's very, very similar, then that's a good indication that they must have been derived from a common ancestor and therefore be homologous. Now, it's not 100% because there's a couple of other, well, one other major way that we can have um, similarity that is not homologous, and that is convergence. And some people also will use the term parallel evolution. I really think parallel evolution is a subcategory of convergence, so we won't worry about it. I may define it in a later lecture, but for now, just know the term convergence. So let me give you an example. And we're only going to look at one feature for these organisms. We could evaluate others, but to illustrate the principle, let's just look at one feature. I've got a picture of a great white shark and an orca, sometimes known as a killer whale. They both have a dorsal fin that helps to stabilize them and keep them upright as they are moving through their uh, aquatic environment. So is this dorsal fin homologous? Did it come from a common ancestor and that was inherited all down the line? Or is the similarity due to convergence? Now let's give you a formal definition of convergence. It's one that you should already know, but just to be sure. Convergence is when we have similarity due to selection for a common environment. So in other words, a similar trait randomly evolved and then was selected for because organisms were exposed to similar selective regimes. So we could go through our list here. Let's see if we can establish whether or not this dorsal fin is homologous. Morphological position. Yeah, they're in a fairly similar position. Right? So maybe that would provide a bit of evidence uh, support for the idea that they're homologous. Are they similar? We could maybe look at their function, assess similarity by their function. We could look at their histological makeup. Right? Are they the same tissue layers? Maybe do they develop? Are the same genes controlling them? And that's tricky to do. It's hard to do developmental biology on these type of organisms because we have to look at embryos and gene expression embryos, and that can be very, very tricky. But we could potentially gather data and maybe come up with an idea. However, there is a third option, and in fact, this third option is the best way overall to establish homology. And of course, if you have supporting evidence from all three of these, if they're in the same morphological or similar morphological position, if they have very similar structures and there's overall very, very much the same, and then we can use this third option also, that's, that's ideal. But sometimes uh, we have to use this third option as kind of the... Um, arbiter, the final decider of whether or not things are homologous. And so this is the best way to do it. So the very best way to establish homology is to map characteristics onto a phylogeny. So here I have a phylogeny of the vertebrates. And notice I've got fish, including sharks, down here. And fish have dorsal fins. The sharks are just uh, one of many fish. A few fish have lost them. But by and large, it looks like dorsal fins was an ancestral trait of the fish. However, Somewhere anciently, before the evolution of the tetrapod vertebrates, that dorsal fin was lost. And we know that by looking at this, you know, frogs, uh, all of the reptiles, um, at least all the living reptiles, I don't know about some of the extinct ones, um, platypus, opossum, all of these organisms, humans, mice, elephants, they do not have dorsal fins. So it's fairly clear that that dorsal fin was lost in our ancestor. And in fact, we can maybe say that the dorsal fin was an ancestor, or the absence of a dorsal fin is an ancestral characteristic for this. Although typically people don't like to define groups by the absence of something. Okay, So we mark the origin of the dorsal fin down here. It was lost in the ancestor of all of the mammals, well, all of the tetrapod vertebrates. And then it was not regained until the ancestor of the living whales and dolphins, this group Cetacea. So dolphins, all of the whales have, to one extent or another, a dorsal fin. Okay, So it's not a homologous trait because it was evolved independently. It was evolved once in an ancestor, lost, and then re-evolved just in this small group of mammals, the Cetaceans. So in that case, we now know that this is not a homologous trait. So the very, very best way to establish homology is to map the origin and loss of characteristics
onto a well-supported phylogeny. Now you can see that it's a little bit more complicated in this case. It wasn't just evolved twice. So if I looked at a tail, and this one's a little bit of a stretch because sharks, although they have this flattened dorsal tail, whales do too. It's a very, very different mechanism for propulsion. Whereas we have lateral movement side to side for propelling sharks and fish. And whales have this uh, uh, dorsal to ventral motion, the up and down. So be aware that this may even fail our assessment of overall similarity. Although they're superficially similar, the fine details of it give away that it's quite different and maybe not uh, inherited from a common ancestor. But certainly when we map the presence of a uh, dorsal tail onto this, we would have, again, the same thing, a complicated version. Gained in an ancestor, lost in the descendant when we make the transition to a terrestrial environment, and then re-evolved in whales. So that can give you a little bit of the ideas of complexity of assessing homology. Now, there is another related term, although it's not an exact opposite to homology, and we'll look at some of the fine distinctions in our next slide. But there's a related term called homoplasy. Okay, there are two causes of homoplasy, one of which we've already established. So let's define it. Homoplasy is where we have a more complex history of a characteristic rather than simply being evolved once and then everyone still has it. If it's more complex than that, we call it homoplasy. And that means we have to mark that character more than once onto a phylogeny. So one way that we get homoplasy, one of the, the things that generates homoplasy is convergence. If something evolves separately twice, then we have similarity, we map it onto a phylogeny, and we realize it's not homologous because it evolved separately, so that is convergence. So current convergence is a form of homoplasy and it's in contrast to homology. And I know this vocabulary is a little bit awful, it's review for many of you, but if not, you just have to learn it. I didn't make it up, so you don't can't blame me for the way. They're based on Greek words, and they mean some things, but they're not familiar enough to most English speakers that it's useful to look at the etymology of these words. So you just need to remember them. Simplesiomorphy is an ancestral characteristic that two or more descendants share. However, it's distinguished from a synapomorphy, and there are two ways that we can distinguish a simplesiomorphy, so we'll look at both of them. And so then we'll come back and talk about why a simplesiomorphy is homoplasy. So let's look then at some of the ways that we can, there are two ways that we can get simplesiomorphy. Okay? The first way that we're going to talk about is when an ancestral trait is lost in a subset of the descendants. Okay, so a good example of this, and this is one of the reasons why birds were not originally recognized in their uh, valid group. Let's look at uh, scales. So reptiles were defined originally as these flat dermal scales covering the entire body. And that evolved in an ancestor, and for a long period of time, all of the descendants of the reptiles had that ancestral feature. However, those scales were lost more um, specifically. They were modified into a very, very different form that we call feathers. So scales or feathers are really just highly modified scales. But if we're going to define a scale as a flat dermal plate for protection on the skin, then birds don't have that, at least not over their whole body. So we could mark that as a lost. So this becomes a symplesiomorphy. Now realize symplesiomorphies are still a form of homology if we're just considering the original character. Because crocodiles, lizards, snakes, they all still have these dermal scales and they all inherited them from a common ancestor. But a subset of that valid clade has lost that characteristic. We could also say cold-bloodedness, right? If cold-bloodedness we define as a character, it was lost in the birds, okay? So the remnant of, those, of that group that still has that ancestral character still inherited from a common ancestor, but some of them have lost it. So symplesiomorphy is a more complex, we have to mark the origin and the loss of the trait. Now the other context that you'll see symplesiomorphy used in, and this one's not as critical for our inference of phylogeny or for some other things that we're going to be doing, but this is another one that's used, is when we pick a, a ancestral trait that is too distant, where every member of the group still has it, but it didn't originate with the ancestor of the group that we're talking about. It originated in an ancestor that's much more ancient. So for instance, if I define, we already talked about a bony skeleton, but let's pick a different one. Let's say I say eyes 
is a synapomorphy for mammals. And if we look across all mammals to one extent or another, some of them are reduced, but they're still there. All mammals have eyes, right? You say, oh yeah, all mammals have eyes. That's a great synapomorphy. But then when you start looking at other organisms, they also have eyes. And so you quickly realize that eyes is actually a much, much more ancient characteristic and is not a defining synapomorphy for the group mammalia. There are good, many good synapomorphy for mammalia, but eyes is not one of them. And so that way, symplesiomorphy is often used that way. If you define a group and a characteristic evolved in a much more ancient ancestor than the, an than the ancestor of the group that you're talking about, that could also be a, talked about as a symplesiomorphy. Okay? So we've defined synapomorphies evolved once. All of the descendants have them. We've defined symplesiomorphy, evolves once in an ancestor and then is lost in some of the descendants. And that's the best definition. That's the one we're going to be focusing on. And then we talked about convergence. Convergence uh, is where a character evolves independently twice. Now, these bars don't represent anything other than if it's um, in an ancestor of one of the lineage, it represents a gain and then a loss. If they're in two different descendants without marking an ancestral node for either of them, then it uh, denotes convergence. And both of those, both a gain and a loss, or two independent gains of a characteristic, are homoplasy. And homoplasy is a more complex explanation rather than it was gained once and everyone still has it. Okay, so review those terms, review those words, make sure you're familiar with them. Make sure you can identify and recognize and maybe even diagram these different types of evolutionary patterns on a phylogeny. Okay, these are going to be important and critical for us. Okay, now we've talked about establishing homology in morphological features, and that's pretty easy. So let me pose a question to you, and then this will maybe complicate it a little bit. Is this structure that I've diagrammed here, I, I didn't do this diagram, but this diagram and this photograph are those representative of homologous structures. So in other words, are these structures homologous? Bird, forelimb, bat, forelimb. So you may be going through your head again and thinking, oh, how do I establish homology? Number one, are they similar? Right? So we establish positional. We maybe look at position first. right? Yeah, they're in the same basic position. That seems to be indication that they're homologous. Okay, Are they similar? Do they have the same bones? And when you look at it, yeah, they have a bird has a, a humerus, a radius, and an ulna. A bat has a humerus, a radius, and an ulna. The radius is, I think it's radius. One of the, those bones is rather small, but is there. Uh, they have phalanges, although the bird only has three of them. They have some, although reduced in the bird, they have some carpals and metacarpals. So yeah, it's fairly clear that these are homologous. And if we map the origin of the forelimb onto a phylogeny, we know that it came in the ancestor of you know the fish going way, way back. So yeah, in that case, as a forelimb, these are homologous. Now, what if I say, let's define it as a wing, as a flying forelimb? Or in other words, is the ability to fly in the bird and the bat, is that homologous? And again, you could probably use either similarity, but better yet, we could map it onto a phylogeny and we'd have an even better answer. So how does a bird fly? A bird has these large primary and secondary flight feathers right, that provide the lift and a fairly reduced um, bony structure to help just provide support for the leading edge. Whereas a bat has skin stretched between these elongated phalanges. So it's fairly obvious that although the forelimbs and many of the structures are homologous, came from a common ancestor, that as a wing itself, it's not. And of course, if we map it onto a phylogeny, the birds which belong to the group reptilia, right, a part of that group, um, the diapsids, to be a little bit more technical, the birds are within a large group of organisms that can't fly. The bats are in the mammals, large group of, of other uh, mammals that can't fly. So when we map it onto a phylogeny, it's very obvious that these evolved independently, and their flight is convergence. So again, this gives you an idea about how homology can be a little bit more complicated than just saying, ah, did they come from a common ancestor? In this case, we need to be very clear about what we're talking about. As a forelimb, these structures are homologous. They're derived from a common ancestral forelimb. But as a wing, as a structure that can fly, uh, 
They are not homologous because the ability to fly was derived independently and is therefore convergent. Okay, so just be aware of that. Sometimes homology has more shades and is a little more complicated. Okay, let's look at a molecular example. Now, I'm going to give you a example and then we'll explore it in some detail. Cows and other ruminants, close relatives, have an enzyme that is excreted, sorry, secreted into their stomach um, and is used to help digest cellulose. Right, there's a it's big and complicated, and they have multiple chambers and bacteria and other um, protozoa that help them to digest it. But part of that process for them to digest cellulose is this lysozyme enzyme. There's a group of colubine monkeys, including the langur here, that can also digest cellulose, and they use that same enzyme, lysozyme, to digest cellulose. So, is this ability to digest cellulose homologous? Did it derive from a common ancestor? And so when we look at it, the reason those both those enzymes have the same name, they're both called lysozyme, is because they have similarity. Okay, And so if we just looked at it, if we looked at position, is it in the same location in the genome? I guess that's how you do position for uh, molecules. That's really, really tricky for molecules because positional, um, the location of genes changes very, very rapidly and evolves quite dramatically. So that can be very tricky. That might change uh, even within a small group of closely related organisms. So position is not usually very helpful for evaluating the homology of uh, an enzyme. Okay. So then we look at overall similarity. And uh, biochemically, in the sequence, they're quite similar. We may want to consider they're more similar than closely related organisms. So if we look at other primates that can't digest cellulose, like humans, right, or baboons or gibbons or any other of the monkeys that, that do not do this, um, then we would maybe be able to compare the lysozyme here to the primates, compare the lysozyme here to the other arteriodactyls, which are the close relatives of the cows and their relatives, and we can maybe come up with some very, you know, maybe complex. We'll do a little bit of that in this class, but Remember, I told you there's a better way. If we want a good answer, right, we could look at similarity. So I have downloaded and shown you a picture here. I've downloaded in Mega the Langor lysozyme, the monkey, and the cow lysozyme. And yes, they are very, very similar. And again, maybe if we want to say how similar, we want to compare them to other species. So if we assess whether this level of similarity is unusual, right? But I want to talk a little bit about what this DNA alignment represents, okay? In short, the DNA alignment is a statement of homology. And in fact, it's a little bit like the diagram we had here where we had color-coded all the way back here. We'd color-coded different parts of this complex structure to uh, infer homology. So we say this bone, the humerus, the humerus, the humerus, and all these, that's homologous. We can compare them. I'm not going to say, oh, let's compare the humerus to the phalanges, right? Because they are not part of that. Uh, and then the same position, right? So they're not com comparable. I'm not going to compare the ulna to the humerus in the whale. You know, we don't say, oh, look, the humerus whale is similar to the human ulna. That's not a valid comparison. We need to make sure we are comparing uh, the same features. And so the alignment here, this gene alignment, is a little bit like looking at the entire forelimb. And therefore, each position in my alignment is like an individual feature within that larger character. So each column represents a single character state within the larger overall homologous gene. And so if I look at this position, I say, oh, look, both the cow and the langur have an adenine at that position because I've done the alignment. I've made this uh, comparison between individual sites. And I'd say they both have an adenine. That's probably a synapomorphy, although I maybe would want to include more samples. But it's a potential synapomorphy for the langur and the cow. They inherited that adenine most likely from a common ancestor. Whereas here I have, oh, look, there's a mutation that has occurred. There's been a change. So at this position, we don't have homology, we have a, a, a mutation, at, at least in one lineage. Okay, So just be aware of that. And in some cases, we may have not only uh, substitutions, where we have a mutation that changes the, the base pair, we may also have an insertion or a deletion. So let me pose this question and then think about it. We'll come back to answer it at the end of this discussion.
I do an alignment, and I notice that the monkey has three extra nucleotides at this place that the cow is missing. Is this an insertion or a deletion? So basically what I'm saying, did the ancestor of these two organisms have a sequence that was more like the monkey with those three nucleotides there, or did it have a uh, sequence more like the cow, and those were missing, and then, you know, so which direction was the mutation? Did we gain DNA in the ancestor of the monkey, or did we lose DNA in the ancestor of the cow? So think about that. How would you establish whether this was an insertion or a deletion? And in fact, we could do the same thing up here with a substitution. Did the ancestor of these two organisms have a G, or did it have an A, a guanine or an adenine? You know, which direction was this mutation? So think about how you would establish that. And you may not know right off the hand. We'll talk about it a little bit here in, at the very, very end and begin to establish that. Okay. Now, but before we do that, let's take a look at the lysozyme. So here I have a phylogeny. Um, these notes on the branches are not meaningful for our discussion here, so we'll ignore them. But we're just going to look at the relationships. Here I have the cow, which is part of the group right here, right? Ceratodactyla, cows includes other groups also. But in the cow and its close relatives, we could mark the origin of that lysozyme's ability to digest cellulose here. Oops. Whereas the langor, of course, is part of the primate groups, only distantly related to the cow, the carnivores, the horses, uh, to some extent, uh, they can do it. So we may look, want to look at their lysozymes. Chiroptera can't. The um, shrews and hedgehogs can't digest cellulose. Most primates cannot. It goes right through us. It's, it's you know, it's uh, fiber. It's, it, it's helpful as part of our digestion, but we can't derive energy from it. But the langor monkeys can, in part because of that lysozyme. And so if we mark the lysozyme itself, all these organisms have that enzyme. We can find it and put it into the alignment. So the, sh the longer answer to are these molecules, molecules homologous is much like the wing example. The molecules in the cow and the langor and all the other lysozymes that we find in mammals are homologous. They came from a, a common ancestor. It's fairly obvious. However, the ability to digest cellulose is not homologous. So it's a little bit like the wing example, right? As a forelimb, these are homologous, but their ability to fly was derived independently. As a gene, the lysozymes here are homologous, but the ability to digest cellulose was derived independently. So again, homology can be a little bit more complicated. All right, before we end this discussion, let's talk about how we would establish this. So the best way to establish the direction of a change, was the ancestor here missing these base pairs, or did it have the longer sequence like the monkey? The best way to do that is to gather additional data from different organisms and then map the change onto a phylogeny. So if I sequence another primate, let's say I sequence a gorilla, and I notice that the gorilla is missing those base pairs, and then I do a horse and a whale and a whole bunch of other mammals, and they're all missing these three base pairs, then it's fairly obvious that this is a recent mutation that added DNA to the monkey, to this one species of monkey. If I sequence the gorilla and see that it has that sequence and humans have it, but then I get outside of primates and none of the other mammals have it, then that's a mutation that added DNA to a primate ancestor and all the primates have inherited it. Okay, But if I keep going and say, oh, let's look at whales, oh, whales have it, and everyone has it except for cow and maybe a few close relatives, then it's a mutation that removed DNA from the cow and its close relatives. And we will, in later uh, lectures and later discussions, go through how we actually do the detail mapping. If it's a very simple pattern, it's easy to map. And we'll learn how to do very simple patterns very quickly and easily. Some of the more complex ones might be a little trickier, and so we'll go through some exercises to show you how to map more complex patterns. Okay, that completes our, our introduction to homology. We're going to talk about it a little bit more and get into some more of the complexities of homology, particularly at the molecular level, in our next discussion.